In Washington, D.C., a colorful farewell formation as the Navy loses one of its leaders. After 11 months of duty, Secretary of the Navy John B. Connolly resigns his office, returning to his native state of Texas to run for public office. He expressed the confidence that the Navy and the Marine Corps have achieved the highest state of readiness in peacetime history and that they are ready in all respects to undertake any mission. Inheriting the SECNAV's flag and here taking the oath of office from Secretary of Defense McNamara is 52-year-old fellow Texan Fred Corn, An attorney and banker, the new Secretary of the Navy has served with the Air Transport Command and as Assistant Secretary of the Army in 1952. Now a new military greeting. Welcome aboard. At Yokosuka, Japan, aboard the USS Ranger, command of the 7th Fleet changes hands. Outgoing commander is Vice Admiral Charles D. Griffin, next slated for duty in the office of Chief of Naval Operations. As he accepts his three-star flag, Admiral Griffin turns over command of the powerful 7th Fleet to Vice Admiral William A. Shea. Admiral Shea comes from a tour of duty as Deputy Chief of the Bureau of Naval Weapons in Washington. Now his flag will lead a complex of 125 ships and 60,000 men. In the free world, stand for freedom. Major naval exercise in the Western Atlantic. Coming aboard for a first-hand look is a group of high-ranking officials. Secretary of Defense Robert S. McNamara, Chief of Naval Operations George W. Anderson, and the then Secretary of the Navy John B. Connolly. Participating in the exercise are two aircraft carriers and 22 other ships of the Second Fleet. For the visitors, statistics and reports come alive with tactical action. Attorney General of the United States, Robert Kennedy, joins the group for a demonstration of naval aviation. And a fitting climax in this age of missiles. Astronauts Alan Shepard and Virgil Grissom flank their commanders-in-chief, Admiral George Anderson and General Curtis LeMay, in ceremonies at the Pentagon. In recognition of their suborbital flights, each will receive a pair of astronaut wings. Shepard becomes the first, and to date, the only Navy man to rate the newly adopted insignia. It's a shooting star superimposed over the traditional naval aviator's wings of gold. To earn it, naval aviators must fly at least 50 miles above the Earth in a powered space vehicle. Fifty years ago, at the birth of naval aviation, we recognized naval aviator number one. Now it's naval astronaut number one, Commander Alan Shepard. This ceremony at Arlington National Cemetery honors naval aviator number 608, a man who used aviation to pioneer the Earth's last great areas of exploration. His statue displays the furs in which he braved the biting cold of the Arctic and the Antarctic. Rear Admiral Richard E. Byrd, his exploits now immortalized on the Avenue of Heroes. His son and grandsons join numerous representatives of government and science in honoring Richard E. Byrd. The Earth's poles were his backyard. A pioneer on the distaff side. She's Wave Lieutenant Charlene Sonnison. She's the first to ask for and receive assignment to line duty at sea. And here reports aboard the USS Mann for an 18-month Pacific cruise.
Lieutenant Sonnison's duties aboard the transport are administrative. Joining two Navy nurses already aboard, she'll look after the comfort and welfare of families of military personnel being moved to and from foreign ports. Yes, women are getting more attention every day. And now, women passengers are pleased to find more of the woman's touch aboard a Navy transport.